morning, everybody. Hope everybody's had a good bank holiday weekend. Uh, Gavin White here, CEO of Autotech Recruit again for Autotech Talks. Um, and bright and early on this Monday morning, I've got Jack Allman, so co-founder and director of ASF Finance. Morning, Jack. How are you? Very good, Gav. How are you doing? Yeah, very good. Thanks, mate. Very good. Have a good weekend. Yeah, very nice. Nice bank holiday weekend. Obviously not the same as normal, but uh, good all the same. Thank you. Yeah, weather was pretty decent as well, to be fair, wasn't it? So, yeah, lovely. Just shame we couldn't get down the pub. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. So, w w um, for those of you who know, do you want to just give a just a quick uh, background of uh, what you do, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, at Auto Service Finance, we provide very simple alternative payment options to the automotive aftermarket. Very simply, we provide interest-free uh, payment options to allow customers to spread the cost of their vehicle maintenance by accessories and merchandise and additional parts and, and add-on products as well. Obviously, helping customers to sell more of the work, um, to, helping customers rather to buy more of the work that gets identified on their vehicle and allowing dealers to maximize those revenue opportunities. Uh, we currently work with about just over 50% of the AM100. So it's a, gr it's a growing concept and something we've seen accelerate massively um through this period as well mm, yeah i could imagine i can imagine and uh hence my call to you because i thought it was uh quite relevant given the uh the current situation that we're in and, and i think it will be when we come out yeah. the other side of it um so yeah i mean uh, part of the reason why we why I sort of when i called you the other week to see if you wanted to be part of this i think you know obviously you know fintech industries that you're you're involved in at the moment and i think they're they're becoming more and more of our daily lives as a consumer, um, business, everything, you know, and I, I thought it, you could, you can kind of see, well, we've seen how it's gone through changes in the last decade and actually you could see what the future, future was probably going to look like as well. But, you know, the COVID-19 situation actually is that accelerated that now, you know, and um, so, you know, a few questions that we've put together for you today. So I'll sort of start off with the first one and, you know, vehicle design significantly impacted uh, by disruptive technologies. However, it doesn't appear that it's filtered through to the automotive uh, aftermarket. Would you agree that the sector has been slow to adopt in digital digitalization? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a an interesting point. Like you say, I mean, if we if we dial specifically into the aftermarket side of it, I think it's not necessarily an unfair argument um, to present. I think obviously huge amounts of investment goes into the research and design and the manufacturing of vehicles and, and new uh, concepts. Um, obviously, the, the pressure for most manufacturers to do that to do that in electric vehicles is huge. Hence, the you know the collaboration we're seeing across manufacturers there. And I guess in turn that makes it difficult, I suppose, for them to to put that same investment into all other areas of the the industry or of their businesses. Um, and I think at times it maybe has lagged behind a little bit, uh, particularly some of the more process driven elements that I think digitalization could, can bring. Um, my background previously was in uh, vehicle health check systems, which I think is probably quite a decent example of, of how the industry is adopting digitalization. Perhaps, yes, took a little bit longer than some might have expected. But it, as I always see, it's, it's always obviously a progressive kind of step by step process. So. You know, you needed vehicle health check systems, for example, um, to be able to do what we do now, which is to analyze the data of how you identify work, sell work, fast moving parts, etc. It becomes a lot easier to audit that. And that then lends on to other added value products like ourselves. Um, you, I mean, as much as VHC has become the norm, I would say, in, in many businesses, um, we still have paper job cards, obviously. Uh, and I think in a lot of businesses, which to some will baffle, to others gives great comfort. Like you said at the, on the intro there, I think coronavirus will accelerate a lot of things. I think it will enhance a lot of digital processes that were, to be fair to the industry, already in the offing, but perhaps didn't have the resource, time, or weren't necessarily compelled to do quite as quickly. But I think for one, you know, this could spell the end of the paper job card for, for nothing more than, than hygiene reasons, if anything. You know, no one really wants to be handing bits of paper. It's why many businesses won't be accepting cash at the moment and simple things like signing um a paper job card with a pen again i think many customers will be reluctant to do that i imagine many businesses that are opening this week and next will be going down to that very detail and removing a, you know a, a shared pen for example and moving to a digital signature which again 
uh, vehicle health check systems enable lots of video systems dealer management garage management tools and i think it's about just probably enhancing or increasing the, the how widespread these um, systems are used um, that we'll see now in the aftermarket so as i said i think yes perhaps a little slow to adopt but it is a phase step-by-step -step approach so you needed things like the hc tools and video tools that you can then build on with a lot of other um, ancillary products that I think is going to give rise um, to a, a far greater digital environment in the in the aftermarket space as we move forward. And again, coming back to what we do, we've seen in this coronavirus period a very um, a very you know big increase really in the traction with our existing sites in how they want to use it across wider parts of their business, but also businesses that we don't currently work with, saying that we recognise we need a digital process, and part of that process is payments. And obviously that's where we as auto service finance can step in providing an entirely remote um, payment option as well. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, yeah. You've been saying that the, um, you reported saying I read an article the other day, the, um, I think it was in the automotive press from a few months back reporting that the, the cars are a, a critical part of people's life and it makes sense um, that if you're able to buy a safer on installments and uh, why not keep your cars upkeep? Um, why do you think the aftermarket's taken so long to offer an option like this? Yeah, it's it's, um, <laughs> it's an example we often draw upon, really, is it, in, um, and, and our examples from the high street, mm. whether it's furniture, like you mentioned, about sofas or white goods, laptops. Um, and even now, if you look on uh, online, um, Gal, I don't know if you're a big ASOS man or H&M man, but you can uh, you can buy most of their clothes, shoes, uh, et cetera, um, on, on finance for as little as, you know, sort of minimum spends of kind of 30, 35 pounds, et cetera. And that's because those industries have recognized that this is actually a very, very flexible way for, for customers to be able to afford um, desired purchases. And this often brings up an argument about the difference between a desired purchase and a distressed purchase. And obviously when someone's buying a car, that's probably very much a desired purchase in most situations perhaps maintaining it less so, but perhaps more distressed. But uh, I think this is an interesting kind of uh, debate to kind of cross really. I think often where it's a distressed purchase, people think, oh, I, I don't really want to talk to them about what their car needs, uh, what it needs to be repaired. I don't like talking about the cost of it and so on. Whereas actually the amounts are the same. If you're buying a sofa for a thousand pounds, very easily you can have a thousand pound bill to maintain your vehicle. Mm. For me, you should be providing the same payment flexibility. So. For example, we provide an interest-free payment option to spread the cost of your vehicle repairs in the same way that someone would want to do so with their sofa. And I don't, for me, see a huge difference in the two. The customer is exactly the same. Often they're in similar geographies. They, they walk off a retail park where the, a sofa retailer may be, straight across into a, um, a, a garage or a dealership, but get offered two very different uh, experiences. And again, keeping the customer experience at the heart of it, I think, it's difficult for me to understand why you wouldn't allow the customer the same flexibility because ultimately it does the same thing. It allows the customer to buy a bigger and better sofa perhaps, yeah. but in, in, in bringing it back to the aftermarket, the automotive aftermarket, it will allow a customer to buy all four tires rather than just two tires, for example. And I think that's a really interesting, um, interesting example to draw upon. Or a pretty in terms of tire being, a budget tire or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And ultimately I think, every customer wants to drive a safe vehicle in its best condition. Mm. Things that stop them, you know, arguably convenient. Some people perhaps aren't that bothered about the safety of the vehicle, but in most cases they are. And I think at that point there, we've got to assume the customer, given payment options and flexibility, will buy a, a better tire, will want to ensure the brakes are um, in, in good condition. Um, and to the same extent with bodywork, you know, that perhaps might not seen as a necessity to some, but for lots of people who take a huge amount of pride in their vehicle, giving them the options that says, look, I want to make sure the car's in the finest, you know, aesthetic um, condition as well as um, being drivable, I think is important. And I think in terms of the industry adopting this approach, another example I always draw upon is service plans, mm. because ultimately they're a payment option. Um, what we do is we allow people to get spread the cost, uh, but we talk about monthly payments and it's all about budgeting. And I think, Lots of people now, if we look at the rise of direct debits, for example, kind of live and die by direct debits. You know, money comes in, money comes out, and you know what you've got left over for the rest of the month. And I think ultimately that's what service plans have done. And they've been hugely successful for both retailer and for um, the driver. It's a customer demonstrating they want to spread the cost um, of their 
uh, maintenance of their vehicle. And ultimately, that's exactly what we do. So we, I guess in theory, we dovetail really nicely with a service plan. So if you've got a service plan customer, for me, they're the perfect customer for our type of product as well. Where a service plan finishes um, with the scheduled maintenance, for example, we'll then take over for lots of the wear part and for scene items. Um, and similarly, for those customers that don't have a service plan, you know, for those lots of people now might be taking their vehicle in, um, it's not been used for some time, they don't have a service plan, we can then step in and we can help them obviously to, uh, to spread that initial cost um, that may then lead into a service plan thereafter. But for me, we're an important bridge for many customers. Um, and I think kind of leading on from that um, in terms of why it may have taken a little time to, for the industry to adopt alternative payment options. So talking exclusively about you know, the, the rise of fintech um, options. I think the internet obviously will have played a huge part in this. Previously where you, know, you perhaps always took your car back to the same garage that you bought it from, the internet to lots of the aggregators where you can look and compare deals and you can shop around a lot more. Retailers perhaps now have to be a lot more competitive and a lot more innovative in how they retain a customer, how they sell work to a customer. Yeah. So I think with that, means that with a lot of retailers and garages and, and, and dealerships more specifically they have to look at how do I retain a customer how do I ensure I maximize my opportunity with that customer and again payment options and flexibility around payments I think is, is essential to that. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting I mean you touched on earlier actually uh, about you know the lack of potential people using cash at the moment um, just the use of a pen signing an invoice touching paperwork with that in mind, then, do you think COVID-19 will potentially reframe how society behaves? Will, will digital be the only new norm of payment moving forward across the board, do you think? Um, yeah, it's, uh, like you say, it's, it's without doubt going to accelerate it. Um, I think if in most papers and business sections um, that you look at at the moment, there's, there's, there's big pieces on alternative payment options and e-commerce and, and fintech and so on. I mean, it's something that, Drilling down to a very basic hygiene factor, yes, there's going to be a huge shift away from um, perhaps those customers that still like to use cash. Obviously, lots of the industry now yeah. doesn't accept cash anyway. But I think I read recently that I think there's about 1.5 million unbanked UK citizens, mm. i.e., they rely on cash. It's their only form of, of payment. And you know, for those customers, there will be a job to do for retailers. But ultimately, I think even those customers will get dragged along by this process. Mm -hmm. um, I think for us to take those minority people, unbanked customers, uh, for whatever reason, uh, whether it's distrust or um, something to do with convenience, I think the role that fintech and e-commerce and alternative payment options are going to play are going to be so big in the sense that many retailers will turn to this as perhaps their only um, preferred payment option. Um, they all get dragged along as well. But I think what's interesting is that <laughs> From a retailer's point of view, you don't want to leave customers behind. You've got to make sure that you know you do try and cater for the majority. But there's going to be definitely uh, an acceleration of customers being more accepting of using uh, contactless um, payment options, digital payment options in lots more lots of different payment um, uh, transactions. I think, for example, first of April, the, the contactless payment was increased to forty five pounds. I think yeah. tap and go. Yeah, yeah. So small examples like that, you know, recognizing even for this, because ultimately that's what a lot of people still use cash for, the smaller transactions. Mm. So you can see from that very example there that people are going to start moving away from those smaller transactions with cash. Yeah. And I think providing um, digital alternative payment options gives much greater flexibility to the customer. You're not going to get that with cash, obviously. Um, and providing that flexibility is going to be key to coming out, from my point of view, coming out of coronavirus as quickly which I think is essential and as strongly as, 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 as possible to try and get back to pre-corona levels as soon as possible. Many retailers and manufacturers are obviously having a great um, start to the year. So providing those payment options, encouraging customers um, to spend money is, is going to be key, obviously in the right way and when people feel safe to do so. So I think it will become the new norm and people keep talking about what the new normal is going to be. Um, it will become the new norm. It already is the new norm for a lot of customers. I think it will just accelerate it even more so for those, and it will drag along those that perhaps are a little bit uh, yeah. reticent before, um, just through, um, uh, again, basic hygiene um, and, and limitations placed on them by retailers. 
Well, look, look how many of us are now using Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Skype and everything else over as much as we have done over the last six weeks. You know, me, me being one of them was probably, you know, still stuck in your ways a little bit, like getting out in the car, driving 200 miles to have a face to face meeting. You know, I think that's going to completely change the way people do business potentially moving forward now. You know, so yeah, uh, I, I agree. And I think what's, what's really interesting is how far you know digital can take us and it happened just literally overnight because people have had to do it you know yeah exactly and I, and I think it's um what's exciting as well is is how quickly it's happened and then suddenly like you say i'm not driving 200 miles to a meeting frees up a lot more time and it then plays into convenience and convenience is an incredibly powerful force for why people do things if it's convenient people are more likely to do it and repeat doing it mm. and i think payments can go a long way to do this there's some really exciting technology coming out you know for one, it's a bit of a buzzword, but open banking, which essentially will initiate much faster payments between retailers and customers in a far, secure, far more secure and also cheaper, cheaper way for, for many retailers. But also the way that, I mean, you'll have seen that in supermarkets, you have self-checking terminals, uh, sorry, so checkout um, payment options. But I think you're going to start to see the rise of even uh, more convenient options. So the fact, you know, my local Sainsbury's here is doing it. They've removed all tills altogether. So you, you purely you know, use your app and you pay as you go and you walk out the store without, as you would see, physically paying. Mm. You're going to start to see more and more of that about the way that people can use you know, physical options to pay. So I mean, we're all familiar with Apple Pay using a fingerprint um, mm. to pay. As we start to use things like Zoom and more digital-based payments, we're also going to start to be able to leverage you know, the behavior of the way someone moves around a keyboard and uses their um their keyboard whether that's swiping or tapping mm. etc that all builds a pattern on an individual so that you can build the transaction securely based on them recognizing how you swipe how you tap and so on and mm. i think all these sorts of things are going to be even more convenient so you can go in and out of the shop without as you would see it traditionally paying a, a till um, in many changing rooms you know i think it's h m now they're looking at can you pay just by using a qr code um getting finance within the changing room once you're trying on clothes for example this will start to become the new normal. Some will be slower to adopt, but it will get there. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, just touching on the point you made earlier, I mean, during the pandemic, obviously requests for contact, contactless payments and transactions have grown. However, this could um, face to extended uh, more than just payments. Um, when contactless options, do you think the aftermarket will begin to adopt following us? I mean, I think we probably just touched on some of that really, but you know, yeah. I think, you know, you always see a bit of a trend potentially. I'm, I'm not just putting a blanket across here, but you know, the dealers dealers seem to adopt this first, and then and, you know, the aftermarket will probably pick this up. You know, six months, a year, two years later down the line. But again, you know, I I know your business um, is very much at the moment sort of dealer based mainly. But you know, do do you see this changing for you guys moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, for me, for the last few years, regardless of coronavirus, I think there's been a, um, a dilution really of that divide between the main dealer um, and uh, independent sector as well. Um, I think, um, again, the internet would have driven that uh, a lot. Um, but I think also customers are, you know, are far more willing uh, to shop around, to travel. Um, so I think we're seeing a convergence really of, of the market. And I think as a result, we're going to see similar approaches or uh, processes adopted across whether that's a, a main brand of dealer right down to a small independent garage. I think largely data will do a lot of that. So people wanting to be far more analytical in the way that they run their businesses, removing cash out of that, having digital payments, again, is a huge part of doing so. Um, and I think the role of contactless and kind of no touch approaches brought upon by Corona will be, will be really interesting to see. Because I think some will be more obvious than others. We mentioned um, you know, the removal of a paper job card, for example. But with others, they'll be more long-standing or perhaps uh, less obvious at this point. Um, I mean, for example, from our point of view, we've seen a huge surge in engagement, say, from our new sites, uh, from, from new sites and existing sites, rather. One of the technologies we've been working on is, is uh, that we've released recently and seen really, really good early traction is pre-approval technology. So allowing customers to check before they go onto site what their, uh, what their interest-free credit limit would be with us, for example. So again, helping to encourage the customer to come or, or to rather um, to initiate their car being repaired 
um, where they may be sat at home, like you said, about the, the impact that coronavirus will have on people's pockets and yeah. might be a little bit furloughed, or unfortunately lost jobs, et cetera. And it will help to accelerate that. Similarly, we're taking that step further with many of the integrations we've now done with the, the major garage and dealer management systems, um, lots of the leading VHC systems and, and video systems to allow, again, a contactless approach to communicating what work we're doing, mm -hmm. which obviously has been... Um, commonplace for a number of years but now also being able to authorize but most importantly pay for that work traditionally it may be that you had to physically obviously the only thing you had to do really to come on site if there was collecting delivery available would be to pay for for that work which again seems alien if you look at other industries or other things that you might pay for yeah. that you would all do on your phone or on your computer i don't see why the industry can't do that and again that's what we're seeing accelerate but then if you take it away from just payments in terms of what will become contactless i think it's going to be really interesting i think many businesses did an amazing job right from the outset from coronavirus and it's one thing i would say that i don't know about yourself with, with, with your business but what was really really encouraging to see is that obviously the industry kind of shut down on itself within a matter of days um, yeah. following the announcement but really quickly it went from oh, but crikey this is uh, this is pretty grim to relaunch planning bounce back planning whatever it was so it was about what plans we put, put in place to reopen now reopen obviously was a the date was unknown, still largely a grey area at the moment. But it's really encouraging that straight away it was like, right, we need to get back to where we were. So let's put a plan in place so that when we do relaunch, um, we can hit the ground running um, as fast as possible. So uh, and then lots of them, as I say, put in things, you know, my, mobile services. So, so could they get vans on the road to people's homes and and um, could they repair the vehicle on you know on the driveway or uh, at the side of the road? Um, and I think that's something that perhaps might not go away you know that might be something that actually grows um as people become more used to the idea of services coming to them we look at you, know, you look at i guess the role of collecting delivery for you know amazon parcels and so on people just assume for stuff to come more to more and more towards them and i think that might be something that sticks and perhaps even grows and in addition to obviously the traditional collecting delivery services that, that may exist but then if we look at more i guess the process of someone bringing a car in you and i have chatted previously about the role that you know the uh, the tread and alignment ramps you know may play if someone brings their vehicle onto site or if it's delivered onto site you know can they just like we say you know have a, a driving reception area they go over tread and wheel alignment there may well be a self self-service check-in terminal which again you know, there's, there's early movements of in the industry and i think we'll see an acceleration of those yeah. the whole mcdonald's approach check yourself you can, in you can get on a plane <laughs> you yeah, can yeah, yeah, exactly. by doing a self-service check-in uh, kind of, so how you, exactly. you can cross oh, borders yeah, yeah. with self-service self check-in so yeah. I, and i think that will be something that will will grow as a concept through this period as well so you could go over the you know the alignment ramp go to the self-check-in terminal automatically it's obviously through ampr etc it's picked up who you are it's read the tread it's read the alignment automatically pops up saying you know would you like us to add this to repair order obviously if necessary would you like payment options mm. obviously keyless drop um, again plays into the hygiene um, factor and then i think all of this can then be wrapped up in a uh, in the way that you communicate with the customer throughout that well throughout that day as a micro example but on a, on a larger scale throughout the lifetime of their vehicle at the moment where it might be largely email and phone and perhaps sms based will it be more apt base driven so i know we're looking more and more at the connected car etc many manufacturers and some groups are looking at an app-based approach to communication but if this is all wrapped up obviously again taking me away the, the paper job card will help but if this is all wrapped up in a you know handheld app where it communicates to you the progress of your car throughout the day you can see the car a little bit like your uh, takeaway being delivered you can see your car coming back to you at the end of the day um, mm. You've perhaps never had to go on site. Um, you've perhaps never had face to face interaction. It may be actually, it's all digitally led. So, mm. where you have a video of a technician showing you the underside of your car and what's wrong, and it gives you the window to the workshop. Why would the same not be true of a service advisor? You mentioned how you adopted Zoom so quickly, like everybody else. Yeah. Why could you not have a quick Zoom call with your service advisor to say, um, mm. you know, the vehicle needs attention and the work needs bit, uh, and what the work means to you? Because I think that's important that. I mentioned before that solve for the majority, but you don't want to leave customers behind. And some customers, for whatever reason, will be uncomfortable with a digital approach. That being said, you know, my 
my grandparents have, you know, they've been on, on Zoom throughout this period, hosting family quizzes and so on. So people will adopt it, like you said. But for those who aren't, you know, you'll have to cater for them. So whether if physically they can't come onto site, that might be Zoom calls. But otherwise, if, when you are allowed back onto site, if you facilitated a far greater digital approach for everybody who is receptive to that, for me, it will just give you more time to spend with those that do like a, a more face-to-face a -face interaction, some more human interaction. So I think it will actually allow you to cater for both customers. Um, it will just perhaps narrow down to those customers who you know, prefer um, the touchy-feely um, side of the industry. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it's uh, it's going to certainly be interesting, and certainly from our point of view, from a recruitment um, and being involved in the employment side of it, you know, the landscape of the job may change. Um, you know, you were talking about you know service advisors doing could take it even a step further. You know, we need we need a different sort of technician with the future holds not only because of the technology and the way it's driven and uh, and how vehicles will be maintained and fixed in the future um but you know if you look at say volvo in sweden for example you know that the, the the client deals directly with the technician there is no service advisor so okay. your technician is your your gp your dentist uh, and that approach and all this technology could can enhance that you know so it's um you know i think there's some uh, could be some potentially really interesting concepts and changes um yeah i think that's um you, you raised a good point there actually i saw an interesting business um that again uh, w w i think it was obviously in, in the often before coronavirus but popularity grew hugely was a um a remote plumbing service right. and it's something that i guess you may be looking at internally yourselves with your um you know the flexibility you, you provide around technicians but the idea that could you remotely assist someone um, so with this plumbing business, they would, you know, through a Zoom call, mm. they would guide you, um, obviously around elements that are safe, but they would guide you around, you know, what's the leak, mm. try this, try that. Um, so for a, an hourly rate or, you know, a solution based rate, you could be guided at home by a, a remote um, plumber. Could similar things be done on the vehicle, perhaps a little bit more difficult, but it'll be interesting to see what is born out of this in terms of the way that society my does plumbing so. it, my plumbing would end up in a worse situation than it would <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I've yeah. got to spend any more money yeah. if i just got a guy out so yeah and, well, i'm not not saying it couldn't do it because obviously you know you know there's people like you know my dad for example he's pretty handy around a car can you know if, if it means it's going to save him a few hundred pounds taking his car to to an audi dealership or something like that to, to get it done and he can figure it out himself then you know why not you know there's people have had got appetite for that that thirst to keep learning and and, and try and um, solve them problems themselves and as long as that exists then the, the these situations or solutions will always have a, a place won't they in society so yeah definitely so just moving on to um i think you know you probably watched some of the videos on the lead up to this and you know we've we've been having some discussions around various people of um I think there's going to be quite a quite a big v v shape bounce back some people think there isn't um most people i'm talking to seems to be about a bit of a 50 50 split at the moment um so you know the anticipation i suppose if the anticipation at the moment if anything you believe in the press probably coming off the back of the recent figures that were just released for april um that new car sales may decline um, however, an aging car park will never inevitably lead to a rise in demand for repairs and servicing, particularly MOTs being deferred. Um, should the aftermarket be thinking about payment plans to help customers now who may be struggling financially as a result? Because I think the evidence still suggests potentially, yes, new car sales may decline, they may not. Who knows? I've got a different opinion on that, but perhaps for a different day. But I think, you know, the fact of the matter is. You know, people may hold on to their car a bit longer. Vehicles have been sat on the driveway now for six or seven weeks. I went out and started my car the other day and hadn't touched it for five or six weeks. Try to move it off the drive and the, you know, rear brake calipers were were a bit sticky and seized, you know. So, yeah. you know, there's all these things that are going to start to happen um, and as we start to come out of the, the, the lockdown. You know, that I think the... You know, garages are in a prime position at the moment. Would you agree to to you know pick up on some of this stuff? You know, yeah, I um I think so. And like you say, I mean, 
forecasts are forecasts to a large degree, but there's definitely going to be a challenge on uh, on new car sales. Um, how quickly they return is again re remains to be seen. But you know whether that's based on supply here or, or supply coming in from <clears throat> from other markets, there's going to be certain certain short term challenges on that, which will give rise, obviously, like you say, to an aging vehicle park and. Um, but also, I guess, gives rise to an opportunity in the in the used sector as well. Mm. I was reading in the States, I think Kavana's um, seen a huge spike um, in market share where they've managed to capitalize, um, whether that's the right word or not, but capitalize on the um, on the challenges around new vehicles yeah. and make the most of, of used vehicles. And I think <clears throat> in addition to people hanging on to cars longer, there will also be you know customers buying cars for perhaps the first time or buying a second car because they, they don't feel comfortable getting on uh, public transport or they don't feel comfortable sharing a vehicle with someone outside mm. of their household. Which obviously there's a you know given the uh, the statement uh, yeah, last night, there's a bit yeah. of a debate around uh, spending time with people in your household or not. Um, so I think there's definitely going to be. <clears throat> Yes, there'll be challenges, but there'll be massive opportunities, I think, for the, for the market in terms of making the most of um, the corona period. And ultimately, you know, no one likes a period where you're not selling as many new cars as, you, as you'd hope. But I think it's about making the most of the opportunity that does present itself. And whether that is in an aging vehicle park or it's also in, um, you know, maximising the used vehicle um, mm. uh, opportunity. And I think there's going to be really interesting trends, again, that will come out of this. Um, it's, it's interesting because we actually already, I mean, we, we largely exist um, in a situation from, from auto, service finance, auto service finance point of view, where we help customers is where there's an unforeseen cost. Now, those costs can often arise as the vehicle does age a bit in general, um, albeit, you know, it's all based on mileage. But as the warranty starts to end, that can often be a difficult period for, for, for many people to retain a customer or just to even um, confidently sell work to a customer. And I think that's where we're, we're very, very powerful. Our average vehicle age is about a six to seven year old vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an old vehicle um, that potentially is starting to have things go wrong with it at a, perhaps a more substantial rate. Um, traditionally, that's difficult work to sell. And Traditionally, I'd say that the industry often has to resort to discounting work, for example, to uh, to customers. But ultimately, again, to kind of, uh, I suppose, look at the customer first. It, discounting probably, if you're giving 10, 15, 20% maybe away, you're still only solving the last part of the bill for the customer. They're still having to find 80, 90% of that amount today. And if that's an unforeseen amount, mm. that's going to be a challenge. Again. I think I saw a, a similar stat in the Times over the weekend that 50% of UK adults don't have any savings at all. Mm. So if you've been on furlough or if you've had your hours reduced and therefore income reduced in some way, and perhaps some sadly have lost their jobs as well, you think discount isn't going to solve that problem for that customer. They've still got to find that un, unforeseen amount today. Yeah. Um, I saw Robert Forrester tweeting about I think it's 50% of their retail customers are service plan customers and the the positivity that's provided for both them as a business but also for the customer and I think that's a key thing that it's about budgeting it's not about one-off discounts it's about how do you let customers put unforeseen transactions back into their monthly budgeting plans it's yeah. difficult to think you know if you get presented with a 600 pound transaction if you're given 10% off can I still afford you know, 540 pounds today, that's, that's kind of hard to work out. If that's broken down and say, look, it's 200 pounds a month for the next three months um, and you don't have to pay anything today, you can very quickly start to think, okay, well, I know I'm getting paid in you know, 10, 20, 30 days time. Yeah. I can afford 200 pounds out of that paycheck and 200 pounds a month moving forward. And that's the facility that we provide. We, you know, our most popular product allows customers um, to spread the cost completely interest-free. And I think that's key. And also, again, draws on the comparison to service plans. We know this is how customers like to transact. Mm. So I think providing payment plans, whatever terms you want to call them, payment options, being flexible for the customer beyond offering a cursory 10, 15% discount, I think is important. And the discounting element is a, is a key talking point we use in our business internally as well, because for me, discounting is a really, really difficult thing to address. It sort of says to me that the price I told you the job was wasn't actually the price yeah. it was the price i was hoping to get but in reality i can actually afford to sell it to you for less <laughs> it erodes the quality and the value of the work that you're providing as well whereas i think if you can say confidently look 
is six hundred pounds, or it's two hundred pounds a month for the next three months, you're still maintaining that that work, the quality of the work that you're providing, is worth six hundred pounds. But you are also looking after the customer and providing flexibility. Yeah, that flexibility will encourage customers to come out and spend, um, which which again is important to to a fast recovery. Mm. So whether you've got a service plan or or, or not, again providing us as that kind of additional next step um, as part of the armory. Um, some customers won't need it, which is, which is fantastic. But I think there's a lot of customers that will. You mentioned before about this V-shaped recovery and only time will tell who's, who's right on this. So I think there will definitely be an initial wave of customers, those that, mm. you know, that they really want to get their car you know, back in working order. They're desperate to get their car um, service schedule back up to date, you know, albeit I know there's been OT extensions. But there will also be a huge amount of customers that aren't comfortable bringing their car back in for either economic reasons or health reasons. So it's how do you help those customers? So for health reasons, it might be enhancing your remote capabilities or contactless and no-touch approach. Mm. And for, for economic um, reasons why customers wouldn't, wouldn't come in, then it's about payment options, as you say. It's about providing flexible payment options Again, interest-free payment options like what we provide at Auto Service Finance will help to give comfort and peace of mind to a huge amount um, of these customers. Again, just to kind of talk about one element of our site, you know, we largely used for large transactions, typically two, three times invoice values, un unforeseen circumstances, yet our customers rate us as 4.9 out of 5. So it's an excellent trust pilot rating. Traditionally, this might be a customer that walks away with a slightly bitter taste in their mouth. Mm. providing options and flexibility does wonders for customer um, satisfaction and in turn retention they will be more likely to come back to you as we see with service plans yeah because they feel you've helped them yeah yeah exactly yeah and i think the other thing is as well it's only going to be more um in the benefit of the garage you know for that whole feeling of um helping helping the customer and giving them options because i believe certainly after what was announced last night you know go to work don't go to work <laughs> um but whatever you do if you do go to work don't use public transport so you know quite lucky at the moment because we've been quite sunny so apparently everybody get on your bike but if we we're having a traditional april and may it could have been absolutely raining cats and dogs i can't see that many people that i know of will be jumping on a bike to cycle 20 miles to milton Keynes or something like that so for me, you know, uh, we're you know we're in an uncharted uncharted territory at the moment. Not only the virus, but we're also having uh, you know uncharted weather as well at the moment. But you know, I think the car, personally, in my view, will become more and more important to people over the next coming weeks because Great. it's about mobility. It's about mobility yeah. for people, whether it's public transport. You know, we're not quite to hoverboards yet or anything like that, but whether it's bike, car, public transport, whatever it is, people will want to start getting back to work. We know they do, and it's going to be hook or by crook. So, and the most important thing is, you know, actually, do I need a new microwave in my kitchen? No, I don't. What's more important is I need to make my car, make sure my my mobility is at 100% so I can make sure I can get back to work to earn money to get my family out of this situation and uh, and get back to some sort of normality you know so yeah a lot of people i've seen seen around at the moment and you know we're talking i know we're talking a lot of different walks of life and and people are in different situations i appreciate it, but you know it's local garages to us um, in central beds that have um, you know they have been shut for the last four or five weeks nothing's been going on took the dog out for a walk the other day they were they sort of re reopened and they were yeah. stuck there was cars everywhere you know there was yeah. car, there cars outside all their ramps were full up tires piling up being delivered so you know you could see people were starting to think that way you know about right i need to get my stuff back in order because the moment the government do say right everyone back to work kids back to school da 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 you know the most important thing and because we're still so wedded to our car in this country a bit like that they are in america um it's uh you know i, I still think it's going to be one of the top things for people this year and I, and I think the other thing is as well you know other luxuries that people probably would have spent money on this year like you know a couple of foreign holidays potentially 
I don't think that's going to happen now. You know, who, no. who's going to want to leave the country to then come back in the country and be quarantined for 14 days? You know, so you're taking a family of four away on a, on a summer holiday in the summer holidays. You're talking thousands of pounds. So actually, for people that can afford it, that haven't been, been in a lucky enough position um, to not be that financially affected by COVID-19 situation, you know, is that money just going to be reinvested in a different way? So is it going to be in a new car or a used car or actually getting, you know, spending a couple of grand on their current car to making sure it lasts them for another couple of years? Because we don't know and hopefully we don't, but are we going to have a second spike or whatever, you know? So, yeah, I think you, 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 raised, you raised a good point there as well. Just it's a small example, but for people going on holiday, hmm. it'd be interesting. No, again, we don't know this, but when 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 we'll be allowed to when we'll be able to fly on mass, is it the end of the cheap airline? Will that change the way that people look to holiday? Will that increase the amount of people that opt for a staycation? So, you know, whether that's going to the parts of the UK for your for your summer holiday instead. Yeah. That again, like you're saying before, it gives further rise to how important the car will be to people. So previously you may have may have flown to your holiday, now you may well drive. So is it spending a couple of thousand pounds making sure your car is ready for that holiday? Is it buying a roof box. accessories? Yeah, yeah roof box, yeah. tow bars, et cetera, you know, trailers. Is it, is it that that's going to suddenly start to see an increase across the industry? So it's these knock-on effects that I think are difficult to see at the moment, but mm. there's definitely going to be a change in the way that people um, behave. But like you say, I think the car will be central to it. I think there's no doubt that the car will actually be quite critical to the UK recovering um, very quickly and I think as soon as the industry the car industry is allowed you know it's a bit of a bellwether industry as soon as it's allowed to go back on mass um, we'll start to see you know manufacturing and production and output um, of the country increase significantly we'll mobilize literally mobilize the country again so it's um, I think it's essential that, that as soon as we can we can get back to some, some level of normality yeah yeah so I think um, just touching on a couple of the points um, I think I read somewhere the other day, and I think you may have mentioned it yourself um, um, a few minutes ago. So the fin fintech industry is set to end up eventually benefiting as a result of accelerating digitalization, and I'm sure there will be a surplus of options available. What advice would you give to the uh, to the market um, and businesses to help them choose the right digital path? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think. Come the, with the acceleration of fintech will come options. Um, I think from my point of view, what's important is for them to first look at their own business and how they retail, why they need um, a, a digital payment option or alternative payment options. Because I think that will first, that will begin, that will allow you to map out what the best solution or solutions may be for you. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned before that, yes, you know, our core product and what we, we provide to Kind of well over 50% of the market is uh, interest-free payment options. We also now have the ability to access merchant service providers, so we can take direct payments as well. So facilitating, you know, remote card transactions. And I think it's important for for retailers, and we speak specifically about the auto uh, aftermarket. What do you need from your provider? So it's not about a case of going to perhaps, you know, your your um, who you bank with and seeing what facilities they have available. It's about thinking, well, what do I have? How will this knit into my process? Mm. Because you, ultimately you don't want to have to disrupt anything to simply introduce one more element to your business. So if it can knit seamlessly into your existing processes. So again, thinking aftermarket, if that's your VHC process, uh, your, perhaps your video provider, um, your garage, man garage management tool, will it knit into that process? Does it allow a spritter process for, a split process where someone could get authorized for work, um, accepted for a payment option, and then do all the payment side once the work's completed. So it follows the, the current flow of a transaction a, a, as we do. I think that's important. I think if you simply look at perhaps who's the biggest and cheapest, I think you may then become unstuck with some of the fight more, um, more important details like accept rates, mm -hmm. uh, minimum and maximum transaction values, for example. So it's about looking at the detail and how those things will knit into your existing process as i say yeah and i think that then will lead you down the path of working with specialists um that will then ultimately give you a much much faster adoption um from both your own employees but then also your customer base as well um for example you know we have designed a process that is very intuitive and simple for 
whether that's service advisors, service managers, workshop advisors, uh, managers or technicians to use, but also is, um, is a very, very simple and um, very easy system to digest from the customer's point of view. So it's not confusing. It's very simple. It's laid out nicely. It can be co-branded and so on. And I think that's important that would you be willing to put your name to them? So ultimately they will represent you in some form or another, these uh, digital payment providers or, or digital options. Would you be happy putting your name on there and your customers interacting with it? Mm. Um, that's something that we keep at the forefront of what we do. You know, ultimately our customer is someone else's customer first. You know, we get them second as it were. Mm. I think we always need to remember that, you know, we're not a payday loan company. We're not scouring the internet for these customers. You know, we're helping someone else's customers to transact. And I think that's key. And I mentioned before about our, our excellent trust pilot rating, keeping that, um, at the center of, of, uh, of your, of your decision-making process will be key, but I, again, I would resort back to making sure you use specialists. So, you know, we, we've been working out for four or five years in this industry. We've got a very, very refined process that's now embedded into lots of the additional third party systems as well, as I mentioned before, whether that's VHC tools and video providers, et cetera, that is going to create a much faster adoption a much faster, um, acceptance of uh, of these alternative payment options for the customers and, I, and again i would say try and solve for the majority if you try to provide the perfect solution for every single one of your customers mm. i think you'll just be paralyzed in analysis there i don't think you'll ever get to the end solution try and solve for the majority the majority will be accepting and adopt it um, and then you can start to refine it thereafter a bit like yesterday's speech huh? <laughs> trying to build Absolutely. something for the, just trying to build something for the masses never worked <laughs> exactly exactly so so just a last couple of closing points yeah. and this is something that we're looking well it, it's thrust into our industry at the moment in the recruitment sector um you know ai and digitalization are, are already overhauling vehicles but how much do you believe intelligence will play with the role of the future in the aftermarket sector and you know i touched on the point there about how it's affecting us in the recruitment industry you know ai and these sorts of things are starting to you know they're, they're popping up everywhere now you know yeah. and even yeah. if it's like you know chat bots everything that's around now you know are, are making them some really powerful impacts certainly for us in the recruitment sector anyway you know yeah absolutely i think um like you say there's in, in all sectors and industries this is going to um it's only going to increase. Um, but I think, for the, you know, again, I think it's a positive thing. Going back, yes, there are some customers that, that will be slower to adopt this, but again, they will arguably become more comfortable with it because of the current situation. And, you know, like it or, or not, they will be dragged along arguably by this process. But I as I say, I think it's all very positive. I think if you look at um, the next generation of vehicles, so if that's, if that's electric cars and then perhaps autonomous vehicles, mm. They're going to be driven hugely by AI and a digital process and machine learning. And again, there are elements that we use within our business already, the way that we score and decision um, applicants. Mm -hmm. This will then lead itself on to how the car is communicated to the customer through the manufacturer and connected cars and obviously driven by the onboard computers that will drive perhaps a more predictive approach. So we're not waiting for cars to become um, damaged or, or outdated. You know, it's, it's a far more, um, structured process in terms of maintaining the vehicle driven by the data of the vehicle mm -hmm. um, and i think what will be interesting is you'll see a and i say probably a, a sort of a democratization of vehicle ownership uh, vehicle history where at the moment it's perhaps difficult to understand the full history of a vehicle well if all this data through the onboard computer and so on becomes digital in itself and it's not stored on paper somewhere and it all becomes online, that then becomes a far easier platform um, to utilize in the way that you would then sell the vehicle and maintain the, the vehicle. I don't know about you, but when I'm picking a movie, for example, you know, I'll look at IMDb or, uh, for the rating of it, um, mm. and you get like this very, very well adopted, widely adopted centralized metric that tells you if a movie is good or not. Um, you know, if it, some people have certain rules, you know, if it's not seven or seven out of 10 and above an IMDb, I'm not going to watch that movie. Yeah. Will you get to some sort of centralized metrics as things become more digital, you can then consolidate things down to a few simple numbers that say, you know, this car is a 
a seven out of 10, but that's a widely adopted seven out of 10. That's an industry standard seven out of 10. So with confidence, you can buy this. But that seven out of 10 will dictate the value of the vehicle in a more precise way than someone's opinion might. Mm. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see that, you know, the, the way that the vehicle, um, you know, morphs into its electric state, but also the existing vehicle park, which is, which is huge and it's not going anywhere fast. Yeah. How will that be? um affected is going to be really really fascinating to see and i think the way that that again lends itself into other processes and remote processes whether that's uh linking in you know online service booking for example you know you can book a dentist appointment online mm. you can't do that necessarily with booking your uh, uh your service appointment on time for, for your for your vehicle linking that into qr codes ampr driving service receptions uh you know booked appointment times like with a dentist rather than all just coming in at eight o'clock you know these are all small digital examples that actually could really become a reality very very quickly yeah if that all then gets compressed into a far more digitally led approach then gives rise to much greater data there will be then a massive drawdown on that data in how people behave how people use cars shared mobility um, it's going to be really interesting to see but i think certainly a way that the vehicle will be maintained mm. will become a far more prescriptive approach through this process the fact you can open a car now you know with your mobile phone and the stuff you can do on cap um car apple carplay and stuff like that you know yeah ain't gonna be too far along till you know you'll be able to pay for your service or your your repair or your work that's been carried out in your car through through your phone or through the touch screen you know when you're in the car you know <laughs> it's, uh, yeah absolutely all, all, all the role that, you know that you'll, be re you'll be rewarded for the way that you drive the vehicle in a lot more um uh, in, in, in many more ways so in, different away from just you know insurance purposes mm. but in the way that you drive and brake and so on you know will you be rewarded for that in um you know in the way that the vehicle is therefore maintained and the cost of maintaining it yeah. well, if that's all again data-led it's easier yeah, yeah 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 absolutely yeah interesting interesting times ahead you know i mean it's you know a lot a lot of the ability and that's already there isn't it it's just when when do they release it onto the consumers when the consumer's appetite's ready to to swallow it if you like you know so so yeah. as a final question um before we close up so yeah how, how can the automotive aftermarket ensure that you know the emerge positively by adopting digital practices are there simple tips you can share and i think you touched on a few probably in the previous previous couple of questions um about you know looking at you know yeah. the strategies of what the business is perhaps not going to you know too crazy with certain things and trying to put too much in at once you know but you know is there any sort of standout tips that you can share yeah, I, I think it's um again it's a bit of a buzzword but collaboration for me would be pretty key i i think you know the industry is really really good at manufacturing vehicles maintaining vehicles and, and a number of other areas around that and i would say that if it, it, I, my, my obviously from my point of view being a supplier into the industry would be to welcome those suppliers in to the business so work with them collaboratively to create the best solutions so rather than there being kind of an us and them approach at times um it's very much saying right we're good at doing our element of the business so whether that's manufacturing selling and, and repairing vehicles you're good at doing your area of, of, of your business how do we work much closely to get much more closely together i think that will create the best and well the best solution the f in the fastest possible way mm. so for me it'd be welcoming these approaches perhaps viewing them with a cautious eye if we're unsure of them but welcoming them to say right what is the best common solution mm. because ultimately again i would stress that the customer is so important within this it can be easy for us to assume sometimes in the industry that oh, the customer won't like this because the customer's not used to it. Mm. Well, the customer's not used to it when it comes to buying and selling and repairing their vehicle, perhaps, but they are in lots of other um, areas of their life. We mentioned before about buying sofas, but whether it's you're doing your, your shopping online now, whether you're meeting friends and family via Zoom calls, um, whether you're moving around, uh, um, whether you're moving around through some sort of shared mobility, mm. These customers are all doing many digital things, making digital lifestyle choices that if you then introduce them into, again, specifically talking about automotive aftermarket sector, if you introduce them into, um, into that sector, I think the industry will be really surprised at how quickly uh, and how positively received the, uh, these new processes are. Mm. So from my point of view, I think just kind of summarize from our, our side is 
you know, I would work closely with suppliers and retailers and manufacturers and so on as we do. So we, we have links with OEMs and, and groups and so on to work out the best common solution, which will allow them to very quickly knit together all of their suppliers. So if that's garage management, dealer management systems, video VHC, um, you can knit all those together to create a very, very effective digital process that isn't disruptive for the customer and actually will enhance customer experience, but allow you most importantly to maximize revenue opportunities. Mm. No, I think it's, um, I think it's uh, things that are, you know, since running our business for the last 10 years, I think it, it's things that is certainly on people's radar. You know, I've probably seen it more in the last couple of years than I have done in the last, uh, in the previous eight years before that, where, um, you know, people are starting to link, link the services together now because um, it just makes it slicker, quicker, more efficient, you know, instead of trying to deal with 10 different people in 10 different areas, I mean, all of this stuff, you know, we're talking generally on about a lot of stuff is software, you know, and as long yeah. as you've got open-ended APIs and you can link stuff together, then, it, it, you know, um, a lot more stuff than I know about, that's for sure. But it's, <laughs> and it's uh, you know, the things like that are, is possible. Um, and I think... Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, that's our approach. It takes, time. It takes time to understand, um, you know, I think some people can be, should we say... Um, scared of this stuff or reluctant to 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 get involved in it because they don't understand it uh, and that's not yeah. just from a consumer point of view that's from decision making people within our industry and sector as well um it's kind of like oh i'll stay clear of that because i don't really know what an api is so you know so <laughs> it's uh but you know it anything's possible at the moment isn't it and i think we've demonstrated that over the last couple of months that how quickly people can adopt and you know like you were saying earlier your grandparents my grandparents are same you know uh, trying to show them how to use an ipad two years ago was like literally going to the dentist and having all your teeth pulled out but <laughs> you know within a matter of weeks recently they've managed to figure out all sorts of different apps and you know so when the need is required hu humans as a whole will figure a way out figure a way around how to you know become more robust and survive you know at the end of the day so and um you know and i think technology is only something that can uh, can enhance that moving forward you know and just yeah. make that quick that that better experience for for everyone really so well great jack thanks for today really appreciate no, it but, um you know something different um you know i know we've talked about the uh the industry you know from a parts perspective and um, training and, and some other things but I think this is an area that's really interesting because it's not just about finance you know and that's what I think what we I wanted to try and sort of demonstrate today and we talked about quite a bit is it's not just about the money the percentage the calculation at the end oh ultimately that's everybody's end game I get that but you know so this area the sort of fintech the, the you know the payment culture it is it, it's very engrossing how everything stitches together on that. Yeah. You, know, you, you start looking at in detail at, you know, the, the, the social fabric and culture of the current, the current consumer out there, their mentality, their buying trends, all these sorts of stuff. And it, you know, it, it's a really big subject to talk about. And I think, you know, it's one certainly for me, interests me because I think it's, uh, it, it's interesting to see what, what, how, the direction of the industry is going and what the future holds for us all really and uh, uh you know thanks for coming on today and sharing um sharing your insightful thoughts and uh no, all. Thanks for and about on. asf you know knowing you know we've worked together for a couple of years now and um we we use your product on our training side and you know it, it just proves that actually we've actually managed to get people that want to do training courses have actually taken jack's product out on finance so if you can exactly yeah. do training courses on it then there's no reason why you can't get one of your consumers to pay for their tires oil consumables and and any other major repairs that they need doing so it's uh, i think it's just the way you set it up like jack, like jack says and then how, how you promote it and engage it with your customers because it you know we've certainly used it and it's worked very well for us so thanks yeah, again yeah. Mate. Look after no and uh, speak to you soon. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Gav. Cheers. Cheers.